Ministry of Healing, Chapter 29 The Builders of the Home He who gave Eve to Adam as a helpmeet performed his first miracle at a marriage festival in the festal hall where friends and kindreds rejoiced together, Christ began his public ministry. Thus he sanctioned marriage, recognizing it as an institution that he himself had established. He ordained that men and women should be united in holy wedlock to rear families whose members, crowned with honor, should be recognized as members of the family above. Christ honored the marriage relation by making it also a symbol of the union between him and his redeemed ones. He himself is the bridegroom. The bride is the church, of which, as his chosen one, he says, Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Song of Solomon 4, verse 7 Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives. Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 28. The family tie is the closest, the most tender and sacred of any on earth. It was designed to be a blessing to mankind, and it is a blessing wherever the marriage covenant is entered into intelligently, in the fear of God, and with due consideration for its responsibilities. Those who are contemplating marriage should consider what will be the character and influence of the home they are founding. As they become parents, a sacred trust is committed to them. Upon them depends, in a great measure, the well-being of their children in this world and their happiness in the world to come. To a great extent, they determine both the physical and the moral stamp that the little ones receive and upon the character of the home depends the condition of society. The weight of each family's influence will tell in the upward or the downward scale. The choice of a life companion should be such as best to secure physical, mental, and spiritual well-being for parents and for their children, such as will enable both parents and children to bless their fellow men and to honor their Creator. Before assuming the responsibilities involved in marriage, young men and young women should have such an experience in practical life as will prepare them for its duties and its burdens. Early marriages are not to be encouraged. A relation so important as marriage and so far reaching in its results should not be entered upon hastily without sufficient preparation and before the mental and physical powers are well developed. The parties may not have worldly wealth but they should have the far greater blessing of health. And in most cases there should not be a great disparity in age. A neglect of this rule may result in seriously impairing the health of the younger, and often the children are robbed of physical and mental strength. They cannot receive from an aged parent the care and companionship which their young lives demand, and they may be deprived by death of the father or the mother at the very time when love and guidance are most needed. It is only in Christ that a marriage alliance can be safely formed. Human love should draw its closest bonds from divine love. Only where Christ reigns can there be deep, true, unselfish affection. Love is a precious gift, which we receive from Jesus. Pure and holy affection is not a feeling but a principle. Those who are actuated by true love are neither unreasonable nor blind. Taught by the Holy Spirit, they love God supremely and their neighbor as themselves. Let those who are contemplating marriage weigh every sentiment and watch every development of character in the one with whom they think to unite their life destiny. Let every step toward a marriage alliance be characterized by modesty, simplicity, sincerity, and an earnest purpose to please and honor God. Marriage affects the afterlife, both in this world and in in the world to come. A sincere Christian will make no plans that God cannot approve. If you are blessed with God-fearing parents, seek counsel of them. Open to them your hopes and plans. Learn the lessons which their life experiences have taught, and you will be saved many a heartache. Above all, make Christ your counselor. Study 
His Word with prayer. Under such guidance, let a young woman accept as a life companion only one who possesses pure, manly traits of character, one who is diligent, aspiring, and honest, one who loves and fears God. Let a young man seek one to stand by his side who is fitted to bear her share of life's burdens, one whose influence will ennoble and refine him, and who will make him happy in her love. A prudent wife is from the Lord. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children will rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her, saying, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. He who gains such a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Proverbs 19, verse 14. Proverbs 31, verses 11, 12, 26 through 29, and Proverbs 18, verse 22. However carefully and wisely marriage may have been entered into, few couples are completely united when the marriage ceremony is performed. The real union of the two in wedlock is the work of the after years. As life with its burden of perplexity and care meets the newly wedded pair, the romance with which imagination so often invests marriage disappears. Husband and wife learn each other's character as it was impossible to learn in their previous association. This is a most critical period in their experience. The happiness and usefulness of their whole future life depend upon their taking a right course now. Often they discern in each other unsuspected weaknesses and defects. But the hearts that love has united will discern excellencies also heretofore unknown. Let all seek to discover the excellencies rather than the defects. Often it is our own attitude, the atmosphere that surrounds ourselves, which determines what will be revealed in us in another. There are many who regard the expression of love as a weakness, and they maintain a reserve that repels others. This spirit checks the current of sympathy. As the social and generous impulses are repressed, they wither, and the heart becomes desolate and cold. We should beware of this error. Love cannot long exist without expression. Let not the heart of one connected with you starve for the want of kindness and sympathy. Though difficulties, perplexities, and discouragement may arise, let neither husband nor wife harbor the thought that their union is a mistake or a disappointment, determined to be all that it is possible to be to each other. Continue the early attentions. In every way, encourage each other in fighting the battles of life. Study to advance the happiness of each other. Let there be mutual love, mutual forbearance. Then marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be as it were the very beginning of love. The warmth of true friendship, the love that binds heart to heart, is a foretaste of the joys of heaven. Around every family there is a sacred circle that should be kept unbroken. Within this circle no other person has a right to come. Let not the husband or the wife permit another to share the confidences that belong solely to themselves. Let each give love rather than exact it. Cultivate that which is noblest in yourselves, and be quick to recognize the good qualities in each other. The consequence of being appreciated is a wonderful stimulus and satisfaction. Sympathy and respect encourage the striving after excellence, and love itself increases as it stimulates to nobler aims. Neither the husband nor the wife should merge his or her individuality in that of an other. Each has a personal relation to God. Of him, each is to ask, what is right, what is wrong? How may I best fulfill life's purpose? Let the wealth of your affection flow forth to him who gave his life for you. Make Christ first and last and best in everything. As your love for him becomes deeper and stronger, your love for each other will be purified and strengthened. The spirit that Christ manifests toward us is the spirit that husband and wife are to manifest toward one another. As Christ also hath loved us, walk in love. As the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church 
and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5, verses 2, 24, and 25. Neither the husband nor the wife should attempt to exercise over the other an arbitrary control. Do not try to compel each other to yield to your wishes. You cannot do this and retain each other's love. Be kind, patient, forbearing, considerate, and courteous. By the grace of God, you can succeed in making each other happy, as in your marriage vow you promised to do. Happiness in unselfish service. But remember that happiness will not be found in shutting yourselves up to yourselves, satisfied to pour out all your affections upon each other. Seize every opportunity for contributing to the happiness of those around you. Remember that true joy can be found only in unselfish service. Forbearance and unselfishness mark the words and acts of all who live the new life in Christ. As you seek to live his life, striving to conquer self and selfishness, and to minister to the needs of others, you will gain victory after victory. Thus your influence will bless the world. Men and women can reach God's ideal for them if they will take Christ as their helper. What human wisdom cannot do, His grace will accomplish for those who give themselves to Him in loving trust. His providence can unite hearts and bonds that are of heavenly origin. Love will not be a mere exchange of soft and flattering words. The loom of heaven weaves with warp and woof finer yet more firm than can be woven by the looms of earth. The result is not a tissue fabric but a texture that will bear wear and test and trial. Heart will be bound to heart in the golden bonds of love that is enduring. Better than gold is a peaceful home where all the fireside charities come. The shrine of love and the heaven of life, hallowed by mother or sister or wife. However humble the home may be, or tried with sorrows by heaven's decree, the blessings that never were bought or sold, and center there, are better than gold. Anonymous